the third annual Moodle Moot. And um, it's been really exciting, and I'm looking forward to this session. Please feel free to invite your friends. Everybody's welcome at the Moot. As well as, um, I just want to remind you, you can get a free membership as an educator if you are affiliated with a university or school. So uh, more about that. A little bit about the uh, presenters for the current Moodle Moot for 2013. Everyone can be a presenter, uh, and we're looking forward to seeing you next year as a presenter. Our current presenter is right, let's see where Cheryl is, um, right, where is Cheryl? Well, she's here among the uh, presenters. There she is. So uh, Cheryl is right here with a dog. I believe uh, that's your dog. So we'll hear a little bit more about the dog. People will be coming in as we go because uh, we go from one section to the next with no break. All right, so we've got presenters from around the world. Oh, and that is so exciting. A little bit about Cheryl. There's a lot more and Cheryl's probably going to share it with you. Dr. Cheryl Lentz, uh, you've got DM. Maybe you'd like to know what that is, Doctor of Management, uh, MSIR. I don't know what that stands for, but it's probably a master's of uh, something or maybe something else. Cheryl, maybe you'll share that with us uh, when you start speaking. She is a multi-award winning publisher uh, of the internationally acclaimed series, The Refractive Thinker. And this is how I found Cheryl. And we connected online, and Cheryl has volunteered to present today. It's a collaborative collaboration of more than 80 contributing doctoral scholars from around the world. And uh, Cheryl is president of Lent Leadership Institute. She's dedicated to publishing exceptional dissertation research. And I think that is very important. So if any of you are interested in uh, doing a doctorate, Cheryl is the person to connect. Cheryl is about much more than that. So I'd like to present you with our speaker, Dr. Cheryl Lentz. And I'm going to give you um, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So nice to see you as always. And I'm going to mute. Hello, Nelly from Las Vegas. Great. So let me um, take myself away so you can start. Wonderful. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me. I will go ahead and offer some explanations of the things that Nellie mentioned. The dog in the picture is actually one of my former Siberian Husky rescues, Montana. He was my press picture for a very long time. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, in February, almost a year ago. Uh, but uh, that was my baby. I have two more Siberian Huskies. And hopefully, when we play my introduction that Nellie will offer, you'll see the two latest. I am president of the Siberian Husky Rescue of New Mexico. I founded it years ago. And we still do rescues. And we have George and, Re George and Gracie are the current ones we currently have. And you'll see them here pretty shortly. The letters that were after my name, a quick, ex quick explanation, is DM. It is indeed a Doctorate of Management and Organizational Leadership. My MSIR is a Master of Science in International Relations from Troy State University. So you'll see some of the uh, pictures of the uh, books that I have published. I am now a 16-time published author. I have two more publications actually coming out, one next month and one in October. And the one in October is actually what we're going to be talking about today which is that I am a contributing author and is part of what if you could think like Einstein. I've been a professor for a very long time and my background is in critical thinking and refractive thinking. And part of that is about the RIST method. So if you'll see additional information specifically about this, this title today, it's www.thinkingbeyondlimits.com and you'll see that on the slides that uh, we have listed in there. But these will be some of the books and you can see me all over the net to be able to look at some of the uh, information I have. But today we're going to talk about critical thinking and Einstein. Next slide please, uh, Nellie. 
Perfect. I'll tell you a little bit about our agenda for this morning. I'm going to give you a short introduction. And again, I am a contributing author to this new book called Expert Success Solutions. It will be out October 8th. And my chapter, there are about 20 of us in the book, and my chapter can be seen on this website, www.thinkingbeyondlimits.com. If you're interested in some of my other things, particularly as educators, I have an interesting uh, series that I presented in February called Technology That Tutors, and I use my YouTube channel as well as my blog to be able to do educational things for my students, anything from abstracts to anthropomorphism. So you can catch me on YouTube at www.youtube.com, Dr. Cheryl Lentz. Okay, the main event, we're going to be talking about the RIST method. The uh, critical thinking acronym that I have, W-R-I-S-T, means that critical thinking and help is on the way and it's, it's close to the end of your wrist. Let me sure I get this on my video here, at the end of your wrist. But what we're going to learn today is how to fail faster to succeed sooner by using the RIST method for more effective critical thinking and learning. And then we'll do a short Q&A. So next slide, Ms. Nelly, if you please. All right, I'm going to give you a brief introduction, and then Nelly is the uh, video queued up, perhaps? All right, let's do the video first, and I'll come. back and talk about this slide. So this is a video that I use for my students. Yeah, I wanted to mention that Cheryl is about professionalism and succeeding in life. Keep that in mind as you listen to the Okay, let me put the class back together because I've taken it apart.
Okay. So if you find, excuse me, Cheryl, if you find that everything is at the bottom left, just click on it and it'll pop right back. Right. There it is. Okay. Terrific. Well, it wasn't, we wasn't that fun in there? I tend to like to have a lot of fun in my classrooms and I love video. Matter of fact, if you go to my YouTube channel, there's about 75 different videos that are there. And as educators, please feel free to use anything and everything that you like if it will help your students. But part of what we're looking at is that video tells a little bit about me and makes me feel a little bit human to my students. So they realize that I'm more than just a face or a video that you can see here in the screen. Uh, you'll see some of the pictures in there is very cool. Uh, last year I was actually honored uh, by a faculty award and I was able to throw out the first pitch at the B-52s game here in Las Vegas with the mayor. Yes, that was my picture with the mayor Goodman. Uh, we have a female mayor here and it was just a hoot. So, and then you'll see my dogs, of course, George and Gracie. And regardless of all the stellar and brilliant things, I'll tell you, Nellie, my dogs always steal the show. So there you go. Let me tell you quickly a little bit about some of the things because you saw the videos. I am a former U.S. Air Force spouse. Uh, my husband and I have been all over the world. You'll see some of the pictures that were in Japan. I've been teaching for more than 13 years as a college professor. I am now a 16-time published author, although that's quickly going to change. Next month in October, I will add two more to the list. I have an 11-time award-winning author. I'm very excited about that. Two faculty awards, and I sit on faculty for five different universities. No, I don't teach for them all simultaneously, at least, at least not very often. And I do own my own business. So that will tell you a little bit about me. And this very cool picture is me and the polar bear in San Diego Zoo. It was very, very cool. I got to see Shamu and the new baby that was born just in January. I was very excited. So next slide, please, Nellie. All right, and just in case you weren't able to see the video, or again, you'd like to be able to see the video, I always like to have redundancy because we all know that technology doesn't always work. But this is what that video is you just saw, and you'll see the link to the video directly to YouTube on the bottom of that. Thank you, Nellie. Next slide, please. All right, a little bit about my professional bio. I've had um, some interesting things come with this new book that I'm going to be doing in October. And part of what we're going to be talking about today is proven strategies to shorten your learning curve, to learn to think beyond limits, to think beyond boundaries, to think beyond restrictions when you're facing problems in either your personal or professional settings. You need to learn to fail faster to succeed sooner in order to master skills to move you forward and effectively. And I do this through individual coaching, teleseminars like this. I have some online classes. And I do offer the rest, wrist method. And again, critical thinking is just help at the end of your wrist. And we're going to talk about that acronym here. But again, additional information, thinkingbeyondlimits.com. It has its own little website. So very cool. Next slide, Millie. All right, let's get into the actual wrist method. And for an acronym that means W-R-I-S-T stands for specific elements in the wrist method. So to change your thinking, simply remember that help is at the end of your wrist, where wrist stands for words, rules, imagination, space, and tools. And so each one of these, when we change our words, when we change our rules, when we change our imagination and play, and change our space and change our tools, we change how we think when we're there. And that affects our critical thinking and often changes our perspective to be able to have more effective solutions as a result. Next slide, please, Nellie. Okay, our first step is when we change our words. One way to change our words is to, or change our thinking is to change the words we use. For example, Instead of thinking in your main language, such as English, maybe you need to change to Spanish or French or Italian. I'm going to offer you a story I had in college which still sticks with me. It's amazing. When I was in college, I was doing my um, semester exams for my final exams in there. And it was just amazing what happened is that I was studying so intensely for my German final exam that I started to think in German. And so that worked really well for my German class, but not so much for my other finals. My other faculty were very helpful, but it was amazing that this German language just started coming out because I, for the first time in my life, switched interpretations. And when I noticed something different is when I was thinking in Ger or uh, talking and speaking in German and translating into English, I was thinking differently. For those of you who are multilingual, either bilingual, trilingual, or more, you'll notice that when you think in your different languages, you put things in different orders. You think in different ways. And for German, you'll notice that when we use English, it's verb-subject. For German, all of the verbs are in a train at the end of the sentence. 
And so it was very unique and, and very entertaining, although it was a little frustrating when I didn't realize that I was actually writing in, you know, kind of a, a pidgin English, pidgin German for some of my other exams. But think of the fact that you think differently. So I want to give you an opportunity, because I know we have quite an international contingent, that when you are looking at your what language you think in, and if you get stuck, sometimes all you have to do is to be able to change the words and how you think. I'll give you another example in there. I have the, one of the names, I own my own publishing company, I own an, an academic press, and we have two imprints, the Refractive Thinker Press, which is the award-winning series, we have nine awards now, and that's the doctoral series, we're, we're on our ninth edition with all of the scholars all over the world who contribute summaries of the doctoral work, and then we have the physical books of some of those scholars instead of just the series, but I was having a hard time coming up with a name for that imprint. So I went to different names and different languages, and here's what I found. If you'll notice that my imprint is called Pincero Press, and Pincero means critical thinking in Italian. And it just has such a ring to it that I was thinking, wow, so the solution of me trying to come up with the name of my company was changing the words we use, and I changed it to a different language. Now think of the fact that when you hear people in French argue sometimes, it's just absolutely beautiful. And you won't realize some of the differences that each language have, and because when we look at language, we think differently. Now, a part of what I want to share with you is a lot of unique qualities about Einstein. And Einstein spoke different languages. But he not only spoke languages as we would think of, Spanish, French, Italian, German. He also spoke different languages such as music, such as science. And sometimes he would think in these different languages to change his focus. For many of you who may know, uh, Einstein has a very interesting uh, biography. It's over a thousand pages. It's a pretty big commitment. But when you think about some of the things, there's a reason why Einstein has some of that reputation he has with some of that eclectic nature and the pipe and the goofy hair and things that he would have. Part of that is his ability to be able to think differently than the rest of us. And when he's looking to try and translate science, translate what he sees in the universe, you have the ability to be able to have him go, huh, I wonder if, I wonder why not. And so when he had trouble thinking any specific things, now granted he was a theoretical physicist, uh, there was a lot of technology that wasn't quite available at the time to prove some of his theories until modern technology. Leonard, uh, Leonardo da Vinci was very much the same way as well. But think of that concept of how he had to think. He would shift languages. And sometimes he would shift because he would like to listen to music. He would take for a walk and he'd play with all types of things in his mind. And that's how he was able to adjust, excuse me, adjust some of the, of the frustration he would have is by changing the words so that he would have the ability to, to think differently. But just remember, every language uses different patterns, different meanings, and different ways of thinking. So if you get stuck, think of the idea of changing into a different language. But think of language in much broader canvas. That's just, in addition to just a foreign language, but think of the language of science, the language of music, or specific languages in your industry. An accountant is going to use much different words than an aviator, much different words than an engineer. And so sometimes we think in the language of our deal, if we can change our words, matter of fact, I have a very interesting colleague who does something fun. Many of us go to a lot of conferences, whether it's academic conferences, industry conferences, or just conferences for fun that he goes to conferences specifically outside his industry. Now, he's an accountant by trade, so he will go to all types of uh, things that are non-accountant. Why? He goes, Cheryl, I want to be able to learn to think beyond how accountants think. Because if I can change my words, change how they think, I'm going to get a new perspective instead of the same way we've always done it. Next slide, please, Nellie. So think of the fact that remember that when your help is at the end of your wrist, you want to be able to look at the acronyms, very simple, W-R-I-S-T, and right now we're talking about words. Next slide, please, Nellie. So think of the fact that when we use the same terms over and over, we lose our creativity and we get stuck in old patterns. It's easy when you're looking, you know, sitting around the table with a bunch of engineers or a bunch of aviators. Uh, my husband's a, a former aviator, and so they always talk with their hands and, and do kinds of things. But you tend to see the same patterns repeated over and over, the same jokes, the same, you know, specific types of meanings. And sometimes we need to step out of that because by changing the words we use, we can change how we think when we use them. And so we can get from fuzzy to clear, to clear, clarity of our language in there and our choices. Because think of the idea of when I chose my company. It was the same name, I just translated into a different language. 
when Einstein was thinking of things, he would just adjust the various tools so it could give him a different outcome for how he was thinking. Next slide, please, Nellie. So let's talk about now how we change our rules. And this dovetails nicely into how we get stuck in our thinking when we're inside the box. And part of what I like to think of thinking is if thinking is inside the box and critical thinking is outside the box, what lies beyond the box? Maybe it's not a box at all. And I'm convinced that Einstein was the master of the box because sometimes the box had nothing to do with being a box at all. And I'm not a fan of the box, quite frankly, because maybe it's a triangle, maybe it's a trapezoid, maybe it's something completely different, but we get so bogged down and stuck in our particular little box, just like you see me in this window. I'm going to go off to the side here and you won't see me anymore. But we want to avoid having restrictions and boundaries. I mean, how many times do you hear people say, that's the way we've always done it, or that's how we do things here? which offers rules, restrictions. Even when you go to conferences and people say, well, we want a new way of thinking, you're still confined by if you see the little screen in the corner with my little box. I remember going to a seminar once and it was really kind of bizarre because we were there for 10 days to come up with a very new and different way of thinking. However, we were still putting old ideas or new ideas into old constructs and that's a favorite no-no of Einstein. You can't put new things into old ideas and, new, and old frameworks. You got to build something new and it was very difficult because I couldn't get them off the, the culture of the company, the rules of the company, the policies and all of the things in there. It just was driving me crazy. So I just asked them, it's like just for five minutes, let me just take away all the rules. And you would have heard the entire air sucked out of the Western Hemisphere like, oh, we can do that? It's like, yes, you would have thought we would have solved cancer in that moment. And the entire conference turned, took a completely different direction. Why? We gave them permission to be able to have the entire canvas, everything they could possibly offer, to be able to think in a new and productive way. Next slide, please, Nellie. So what if I could give you a magic wand right today and take away all the rules? There was no money constrictions. There were no rules. The only rules we would have to potentially construct with would be perhaps the laws of physics. Because we all know if I drop this pencil from, oops, let's put it in the front of the camera, drop this pencil, we know unless we're on the moon, this pencil is always going to fall. That is the law of gravity. Well, when Einstein was looking for things, he was looking to try and understand. And the entire way of finding a law versus a theory is things is going to happen consistently the same way over and over. So let me make sure that I just give you a magic wand and I take away all the restrictions. I take away all the rules, all the finances, all the problems that you conceive of. There's no box. It's completely free. And you're free to think in any way you like, what might this look like exactly? And many of you are thinking, going, really? Can I do this? It's like, absolutely. The whole idea is to come up with something brand new. Because when we change our rules, we change how we think when we use them. And often I see in a lot of consulting work, a lot with my students, I see them thinking in the same patterns in the same way. Well, I have to think like an academic. No, you don't. Matter of fact, when I often do this exercise with my students, I ask them what business looks like. And many of them, if many of you would like to do that exercise with me, think for just 30 seconds right now, what is the image that comes to mind with regard to what business looks like? Typically, you will have the, well, business is in an office, and business is in a three-piece suit like I have today, and business is with the mahogany table and formal lunches and presentations. What if I told you 50% of the business in the world happens out at the golf course, happens at the swimming pool, happens at happy hour? My company was actually created on a napkin at happy hour. I still have the napkin somewhere. Why? Because often when we change the rules, you're going to have a different perspective because you're going to go, really? I can do that? Absolutely. We want to get you excited, but to take away any restrictions and think of that true brainstorming. And hopefully you will have the ability to be very open-minded and non-judgmental. Because we do need to make sure that some of the things we may come up with that we don't automatically dismiss because they might be silly, they might be unusual, they might be outside of whatever image you came up with for what business looks like. So you want to have that ability to be a bit more open-minded. When people are relaxed, when people are in a different environment and they change the rules, they change the culture, maybe you go down and just have a beer with your boss and you start talking some, about some ideas. Maybe you go down to the swimming pool. I remember having some of my greatest brainstorms when I went out of the box of what business is supposed to look like. 
Now, now for the last five or six years, I actually work at home. So my boxes, I wish I could show you the camera, is I have double-doored windows. I work in this office, and I have beautiful mountains that I look at. I have my Siberian Huskies at my feet. To me, that's business. Why? I change the rules. So this is what I'm offering to you, because when we change the rules, we change how we think when we use them. So keep that in mind. Nellie, next slide, please. All right, here's the fun one. Remember, we've done W, R, and I. W, we changed our words. R, we changed the rules. Now we're going to change our imagination and play. Sometimes we get stuck in our thinking. It's really helpful to look at our creative side. Einstein sometimes gets that goofy side, you know, the real eclectic hair and the bizarre types of pictures, that funny picture that he has kind of thing. Part of what Einstein had is the ability to laugh at himself, the ability to look at things, the ability to fail, the ability to say, you know what, failure is just part of success, the ability to play. If you know much about theoretical physics, part of his theory of relativity, E equals mc squared, came as a result of Einstein thinking one day of just riding on a moonbeam. Think of it as riding on a rainbow. And he wanted to look at, if you were on your rainbow and I'm on my rainbow, how could we still see each other in relativity? And he played with this for several years, and it's interesting to note that he was actually right when he first came up with this. But 10 years had to pass, and he had to talk to all of his, you know, the experts and the people in, you know, theory of uh, physics and all of that stuff. And it took him years to get through whether or not he was right or not. And initially he was, but he had to go through that. And all it started was play by riding in a moonbeam. So sometimes we just need to get in a creative side. So maybe we need to spend time, believe it or not, playing. What makes you happy? What makes you silly? Perhaps you need to put a jigsaw puzzle together, build a castle made of bricks, play with Legos, play with bubbles, build, you know, go finger painting. Something that's going to get you out of your, your mindset of where you are. And here's a really funny story, is that obviously I'm an academic. I have been a college professor, sometimes living too much in that ivory tower for the last 13 years. And I went to a conference, and the conference uh, facilitator says, you know what, Doc C, we got to get you out of Doc C. Today, you're not Dr. C, you're not Dr. Lentz, you are just plain old Cheryl. And matter of fact, within about 10 minutes of the toys they gave me, I went back to being a four-year-old, and what my mom used to call me is Sherry, so shh, don't tell anybody. But imagine I sat there during the rest of the conference, with their permission, I might add, with a can of Play-Doh. And I had my little, um, and I'm sitting here rolling and making snowmen and making chains, you know, and giggling the whole time. And it was just really fun how I was able to step out of that professional image, right? Step out of that ability to be able to look at, well, you know what, I was taking myself a little bit too seriously, being way too professional and, again, the Dr. C type of voice. But instead, when I took off all of those uh, hats, for example, and I just became Cheryl, suddenly a lot of clarity came to me. I was able to giggle. I was able to take away some of those boundaries and those preconceptions and those perceptions and, and get in touch with who I am. Think, can you imagine? I mean, think of this for the You went to the next, um, the next board of directors meeting that you went to. And instead of starting out with the normal, well, I'd like to call this meeting to order, we'd have the ability to just put Play-Doh in front of each one of their um, things. So say you had, you know, the big mahogany table, right? The big round table, the big, you know, um, uh, would have um, the very deep wood that you would have paneling, that's the word I'm looking for, on, on the walls and stuff. But then instead of the three-piece suits, everybody gets out Lego bricks. Everybody gets out Play-Doh. Can you imagine what that would, be, what would that would look like? I have a lot of my client sessions, but that's how we start out. We just start out playing. And it changes the entire mindset of the room. And if you're really there specifically for brainstorming, then this is going to be something that's going to get you really excited because you're just going to be playing. And when we let our guards down, you'd be amazed at how some of the ideas come from simple imaginations. Now, you do have to be a little bit less judgmental. And that sometimes is a little bit hard because we are prone to be judgmental. You know, we have this, this is what business looks like, and this is what academicians should be look like. And I remember once um, that I met a student outside of the classroom, and I wasn't dressed appropriately for, you know, the business suit. I was just in jeans and gym shoes. And the look on her face was very different because she had a different expectation. And oftentimes, imagination and play gets set to the side. But it's very important. I mean, think of what Einstein's rainbow, the riding on a moonbeam, thinking something silly. That's how he came up with something that's changed the entire course of understanding the world of physics, simply by getting in touch with his little child side. 
So there are times when doxy gets a little bit too uptight, a little bit too intense, but I'll just step it back a little bit and I will bring out the Play-Doh and I actually keep it here in my office and I keep my toys nearby to be able to give me an idea that when I get stuck I have to change my imagination. I will take a walk and go outside and look at the clouds for a little while. I will go and play with my dogs in there. I will go and have things. I have a puzzle downstairs that I like to to use as well because sometimes you just hang on too tight and a watch tea, cot, tea kettle doesn't boil. You've got to give the ability to Step back a little bit. Give your mind something to noodle on in there. And often what happens when I am distracted by playing or my imagination, <gasps> there's when the solution comes. Quick story and then we'll move on. I remember that I was at my doctoral residency, and this was more than a decade ago now. And I was really, really close. And it's uh, probably 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night. So I put on my bikini, I go down to the pool, and I start swimming. And as I'm staking all my strokes, not realizing that everyone in the hotel can actually see me, suddenly the idea hits me. And I am in the pool talking to myself. And yes, I, I work a mile a minute. I'm from Chicago. And that's you know my energy level. So I, I don't often take a breath, William. I see your comment here. That's funny. <laughs> but I remember that instantaneously, I got it. I couldn't get it sitting in my hotel room. I had to go out and play. I went swimming. And apparently, I was rather entertaining. Because it was somebody that they went on the elevator. And I'm dripping wet and not paying close attention. So I'm getting in my room because I wanted to write it all down. I neglected to bring a pen and paper with me by the side of the pool. So it was really kind of funny, but it was something that made me happy, something that was able to change my kinesthetic, change my flow, change my rhythm, change my play, and the solution came. And everybody in the hotel was talking about her breakfast the next day. So apparently when I go big, I have quite an inter interesting way of solving problems. But this is part of it, because when we change our imagination and play, we change how we think. Now, if any of you have been into... Um, Las Vegas recently, uh, they have a company here that's a headquarters called Zappos. People come from all over the world to capture the cult culture and play at Zappos. When I was there a, a year ago, um, October, in their location down in Henderson, they've since moved to the downtown at Fremont now, and they have people walking around in costumes. I saw a girl that walking by, and she was in a, in a pink tutu, grown adult, 35 years old, walking by me, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh. They have this unique culture that people want to bottle and sell because they believe in having fun as part of their culture. They have their own yearbook like we had in high school and college. Much like Google and Microsoft and Apple, you have to sometimes get out of these preconceived boundaries and learn to embrace your imagination and play because that's going to help you in your critical, particularly refractive thinking, beyond the box, outside the box. And maybe it's not a darn box at all. So again, remember, when we change your imagination and play, we change how we think. So happy playing. Next slide, please, Nelly. All right, here's what we're going to do is we're going to change our space. Now, this is a very interesting one that because, because of changing our space, we can change how we look at the problem. And this is a very funny story. Is I don't know how many of you might watch the popular TV show NCIS, but I am a big fan because I like the critical thinking that's on there, and I'm a big fan of Abby. So there's, Abby is in her laboratory doing what she's doing, and she's stuck. And she turns herself upside down. And her boss, Gibbs, comes in, and Gibbs is like, what are you doing? As, she, as he's talking to her right side up as she's upside down. She's like, I'm changing my perspective because I need a new way to look at the problem. And so this is the amazing thing that she had, is the ability to change your perspective. So imagine just for a moment. You stopped for a day and simply went out for a walk. Literally, we finished this session, and you take 30 seconds before the next one, so you don't want to mix, miss a moment of the next speaker. And you just walked out of your office, or you walked out of your home, or wherever you are today, and you perhaps took a new, new path. Maybe when you come back, you just changed your office, you changed your chair, you changed your floor, you changed your buildings that you were in. Because what we see, these are our goggles that goes up to our mind to be able to get our perspective. But there are times when if all we see is what's on the computer screen in front of us, we miss all of the things beyond it. So there are times when I get stuck, I know the warning signs, we each have our, uh, and I need to be able to remind myself that, all right, sometimes I'm going to go to a new place in the house. I have couches in some of my you know, rooms, I actually have one behind me. I'll sit on the couch instead of sitting in the chair. I'll go out in the backyard and sit with the dogs in there. I might sit in my husband's office. I remember when I was going to school, oh, it was hysterical, I couldn't often study at home. So I would ask my friend, I couldn't be bothered because I like very quiet when I'm studying. 
But I would ask, can I just fire a room in your house? I'll sit in the back. You won't even know I'm there because I needed a fresh perspective. Sometimes I go to a library. Sometimes I go to different libraries. Sometimes I would go to Starbucks. Sometimes you just need to be around people even though they can't be bothered. But you have to have that insensation, that, that kinesthetic feeling that I'm someplace new because you think differently when you're there. So that's the part we need to change your space. So next slide, please, Nelly. So here's the idea is we have to change the space around you. And that could very much include your clothes. For those of you who may work at home or those who have a different persona, depending on what you wear, I think much differently when I'm in my Harley getup than I do in my three-piece suit. I think much differently when I'm in jeans, which is why I don't teach when I'm in jeans, even when I'm at home. So part of the idea is we have to change our space. That could be the clothes. That could be where we sit. I know some people that go to the beach. Why not? If we don't have, if you have the technology that we have right now between cell phones, I can have my cell phone be a hub that I could literally, as long as I had reception, take my computer to go to the beach. And I would love that way. I lived in Seattle. I'd go to Green Lake for the afternoon. Why do we have to stay in what our little boxes that you see, you can see in my office, all the certificates, all of my diplomas and things like that. Sometimes it gets too stuffy. Sometimes I need to change the perspective and go upside down or right side up or move someplace else. And it doesn't have to be a lot. When I used to work in corporate America, sometimes I would just sit on my boss's couch, go down and take, you know, to the break room and have, you know, a drink of soda or just sit somewhere else because it changes. Remember, when you change the space you're in, you change how you think when you're in it. All right, let's move on. Next slide, please, Nellie. All right, we're getting into the last one. Let's review quickly what, what we stand for here. Is remember, when you get stuck, your helping hand is at the end of your wrist. Words, rules, imagination, space, and now we're here with tools. So think about sometimes we need to change what we are using or our tools. For example, a uh, show of hands virtually of how many of you actually do most of your work on a computer. What if you changed and actually took out the old pen and pencil? What if you changed to a pen or a mechanical pencil? What if you changed to a highlighter? What? if you change to a crayon. Now this is something that was hysterically funny. I had a teacher of mine who was having a really hard time getting me to be very, very simple. And sometimes I will take 40 words when two will do. And it's been a bad habit of me for years. And she says, you know what, here's your assignment. I want you to write your outline for this new book in crayon. And I looked at her going, you have got to be kidding. Do you know how long it's going to take to write an outline in crayon? She goes, just, just humor me. It's like, all right, I'm up for new things. So I get this little box of crayons. You know, I think I actually still have it. So, yep, I've got it sitting on the shelf. And it was a brand new box of crayons. And I swear no one was looking. I was excited like a kindergartner. And they were all brand new crayons. You know the smell when you open the box? But it was the experience. And then I started writing my outline. And with crayons, if any of you have used crayons in a long time, it had to write very, very big. So I take out the blue crayon and I write part of my outline. And then I change to yellow and I change to orange. And I had a ball. And I understood what she was trying to get. You cannot write long words with crayons. You can't write cursive with crayons. You're lucky you can print like a kindergartner can do with particular crayons. But I got it. I knew what she was trying to do is to try and to get out of the ivory tower, the $40 words, and get simple. Can't be complicated with a crayon. So sometimes we have to look at the idea of what we are using. For example, when I go to book signings, I do most of my work in a computer. I very seldom use a pen or a pencil anymore. I actually have to practice. Do you remember when we used to practice cursive writing? My handwriting signature was really poor for a while, and I went on a bit of a tour in there, and I had to learn to practice. Well, here's the interesting thing. When I printed my name, it was very different than when I wrote my name. And when I had that, you know, wonderful cursive, fancy felt tip pen, it was different still. So now I make sure that I adjust some of the tools that I'm using depending on how I want to think here and how I want to present here from the heart. So you have to make sure that you look at some of the things around you. And for those of you who are writers, I have a friend of mine, he's one of those novelist, detective kinds. He actually still writes on the manual typewriter, you know, the, the hunt and peck kind of a thing. Why? That's the, you know, he puts on his hat, you know, like the Scoop Jones from like, you know, um, Dick Tracy, and that probably dates me a little bit. But that idea of what he wants to get into the character, 
you know, and the jazz music playing in the background. He types on a manual typewriter. There's a great movie with um, Meg Ryan and Greg Kinnear. Um, uh, bu -bu 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 You've got mail. And he talks about his typewriter. And he's in love. He's got three of them. The selectric typewriter and the feel that it, his fingers are on the keys and the whir of the button and how, and how it inspires him. So think about the tools that you use. I just changed to a new computer, matter of fact, and it's taken me many months because the keys are different. The, the numbers are in the wrong order. And it's actually, I'm on my desktop computer because it has better reception. It's, not, it's hardwired instead of my laptop, which is um, um, the, the um, I can't think of the word in there. Way. It's the wireless. There you go. The wireless in there. So it's different. And I notice I think differently because my new laptop, believe it or not, where's, where's my buddy here with me talking too fast? And I apologize. It slows me down because I make more mistakes the way the keys are spaced. So my suggestion to you is to look at the types of tools that you use that will help take a different feel to the work that you're trying to do. And let me tell you, I mean, again, let's go to our board of directors meeting and we're going to buy them Play-Doh or we're going to buy them crayons. And the entire meeting is going to be very, very different. It's not meant to be unprofessional. It's simply meant to connect to the tools that you're using and the imagination. Let me offer one quick example, and I'm sure many of you have heard this because this is a common joke that's on there. But think of the fact that you have a, a huge semi-trailer, 18, uh, 18 wheelers, you know, the big you know, semi-trailers, and it gets stuck under an underpass or an overpass. It's going under a bridge and it gets stuck. And so now every one of the county is coming out to be able to figure out how to unstuck the truck. Well, little Jimmy happened to come with Daddy, who's the engineer on the project, and Jimmy's like six or seven years old. And, you know, he's sitting there pulling on Dad's pant like, um, Dad, um, why can't you? And he's like, honey, honey, just wait a minute. You know, I've got there. And then Dad thinks, and then he goes, you know what? I really have to honor my son. Let me see what Jimmy has to say. Okay, son, tell me what, what's on your mind. He goes, well, Daddy, isn't it funny that when I let the air out of my ball, the ball gets smaller? He goes, yeah. And, of course, Daddy's kind of going, I wonder where he's going with this. He goes, why couldn't you just let the air out of the tires and make the truck smallerized? You know how for, you know, young kids like to make different words. He's like, smallerize the truck. He goes, I'll be darned. Think of the idea that a child at that young age is looking at it as a game. And the fact that they, this young child is able to unstuck the truck when you've got all these engineers and city planners and everybody, you know, and first responders and firemen and things running around trying to figure it out. And all they had to do was let the air out of the tires and the 18-wheeler, make it low enough just to get under the clearance to have the tow truck take it away. And a child will lead us. Isn't that amazing? And here's my convincing. is when I teach critical thinking in the classroom, and we're looking much like Einstein, I find that Einstein was one of the few people that didn't develop fear of the unknown when he, uh, as he aged growing up. If anything, he made more childlike. And I know with teaching my critical thinking for my students, most of the time their children have an easier time critical thinking and refractive thinking and thinking beyond the box or destroying the box because of one thing, they don't know fear yet. And part of changing our tools and changing our imagination and all the steps that I've given you is giving the ability not to understand and embrace fear. Because when we embrace fear, then we evaluate. It's like, no, that's not a good idea. No, that would never work. Oh, I couldn't possibly do that. My boss will never agree. And we go through all the reasons why not. When a child goes, um, Daddy, my ball gets smaller when you let the air out. How simple and elegant is that solution that many adults will miss because they forget that childlike part of them. They forget that simple part of them. They forget to do what some of the things will do here in this five-step method. Next slide, please, Nellie. So think about the actual experience of the tools. What does the tool feel like? What does it make you feel like? I guarantee you, we've got crayons in your hands. You're going to giggle. That's just part of the MO. But you have to understand, because when we change the tools we use, we change how we think when we use them. And like little Jimmy, if we look at the idea of what our experience is through the lens of a child, we will see the world vastly different and usually away from the boundaries, the restrictions, the rules, the fear, and the evaluation and the judgment. And it isn't amazing that next time you're talking about a problem solving, let your children play. Chances are, I bet half a paycheck that they would find the solution much faster than you would because your mind is too busy evaluating why it won't work. Instead of really embracing brainstorming, which like throw it all out there, throw spaghetti in the refrigerator, see what sticks. 
and don't evaluate the judge why, why it won't stick. Remember, my company was formed as a result of sitting at a cocktail napkin at a restaurant with a friend of mine. Because refractive thinkers, we just don't ask why, we ask why not. How could we? Couldn't this be possible? It's amazing when you have that spirit of creativity, curiosity, and entrepreneurship so that you can go out going, you know what, let's run it up the flagpole. What's the worst that people can do? They can say no, right? What if it might just work? Next slide, please. Alrighty, let's go ahead and review as we bring ourselves to the close to another wonderful hour. Nellie, I do want to say thank you for letting me play. This is always a wonderful experience. Let me again review what our goal was, is to think like Einstein. And I believe I have a secret that remember that when you get stuck, help is at the end of your wrist, W-R-I-S-T, where you can change your words, you can change your rules, you can change your imagination and play, you can change your space, and you can change your tools. So I wish you happy, happy thinking, and perhaps just a little bit of giggling when you get back to being in touch with your creative side and your child side, and start doing some very simple things that can have profound results that you can start embracing some of the ways that we can learn to think like Einstein. So the next time you get stuck, ask yourself, what would Einstein do? Next slide, Nellie. I believe it's time for questions and answers, if there are any in the audience. There we go. This is me. Just to give you a quick thing, in the event that we end too quickly, uh, you'll see my website listed, thinkingbeyondlimits.com, although if you just type in Dr. Cheryl Lentz, you'll see me all over the internet between YouTube and about 12 different websites, my books and things, but there's always a personal email. I answer usually within 24 to 48 hours. Please let me know how I can advance your stuff, and if you need anything of my YouTube videos, please share them with your students. They are free for all to use. So I will entertain questions if there are anyway. <laughs> oh, William, if you're very kind. <laughs> That's fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Please add your question in the chat box if you'd like to speak and you know that your microphone works and you want to compete with Cheryl's fast <laughs> speaking. Uh, do that. Let's see. I'm trying. I know the hardest part about speaking is trying to watch the chat box. So, is will the chat box have a transcription, Nelly, so we can go back and look? I don't want to miss any of these. <laughs> You can actually copy and paste it, and, and you can join us um, and answer questions in the course. Well, actually, it's a conference area. Okay, terrific. Okay, so. Terrific. I just apologize. The hard part is when you, you get on a roll that trying to be able to look at some of those, I apologize if I missed any, but I'm looking at the questions right now to see if there's anything that um, anyone would have. Yes, I like that, Cheryl. Isn't it fun? I like to have presentations that are really engaging because I need to be as a presenter as engaging because I know that you don't want to sit and hear some boring reading the slides. You kind of have something kind of fun, kind of like the video and things like that. So, oh, very nice in there. Well, I guess if there aren't any further questions, let me just offer a couple more um, things that you might want to consider. As I know, there is a great book, I'm sure many of us are familiar with John Maxwell. And he's written, oh gosh, at least a half a dozen books. And someday I'd like to actually meet the man because he's been a bit of an inspiration to me. But he has something that I use in my classes as well. And I just wasn't sure if I'd have time to present this. But it's called The Thinking Chair. And let me invite everyone to be able to take a moment. And you're going to find this completely ironic because of how fast I talk. But how many times a day do we think that we are firefighters and that we are more putting out fires and being reactive instead of being proactive. And part of the wrist method is for us to be able to step back, take some time to internalize, maybe be a little bit quiet. And I know for me, you find that hard to believe, and that's okay, you're not alone, that uh, we need to have some space that we carve out where we can be proactive. And many of that means where John um, Maxwell suggest that you actually find a physical place that you go and think. A colleague of mine goes every Wednesday morning to his church, and he likes that quiet type of environment that really, for him, is very inspiring. I personally do most of my thinking by water. 
I need to be at a beach, whether physically or metaphorically, because I'm in the desert and we don't have many beaches out here. But I have a few um, videos of places. I used to live in Seattle for uh, three years, so I remember. And water for me is very inspirational. So I keep a notebook right here next to me, always by my bed. Didn't bring one by the pool that day. That's where I learned it from. Is that when things I need to think about during the day come up, and I'm too busy putting out fires, as we all do, I will keep a list of things to think about later. Things that I will sometimes try and to make a decision. I try not to make very quick decisions. And I will say, you know what? I need some time to think about that. Then I put it on a list. And then I look at my wrist method. And I ponder for a few moments in there when I go to my special thinking place. And it can be up here. It can be physical. But you need to have a time where you can think about the wrist method. And think about things you need to think about thinking. And have that time carved out. And if you have a regular schedule, even if it's only an hour, during your day, at nighttime, some people will have it, they're out gardening, but you have to have that thinking chair time. And this is really important because I am convinced that we do not have that time because we're just so rushed. And I know you find that hard to believe because I'm thinking or speaking so very quickly. But that's how I get my rotor, motor running and the passion, the excitement, and it keeps me really motivated. But there are times it can be a double-edged sword because I'll be very frustrated and very, yeah, I know it's on the tip of my tongue, and if I just stayed here and just, and you got to use the rest method again. You know what? What can I do in those five steps? Where can I go that it's Wednesday? And I try to do some of my thinking on Wednesday, although some of the weeks I've had with traveling, it gets to Friday mornings. But I will spend a couple of hours where I do nothing. And I mean, I shut off the cell phone, shut down my computer, shut down anything that has any type of input. Because my point is to have my input internally, so I can just sit and then I just have my list. And I have a pen or pencil, sometimes crayon, that I will do. And I will just take notes of what is it that I need to think about? What are the problems that I need to solve? Because whether you know this or not, I've, I've done some research in neuro-linguistic. Whether you're sleeping or not, whether you're doing something active or not, your brain's always working. So why not give your brain something to do? And so when I have a problem, I typically like to clean my house. And my husband is very funny because he knows when the house, when I get out the toothbrush, and I start doing all those cleaning things you never do ever. He goes, he looks in there, puts his hand in the door, and goes running back out. He goes, uh-oh. Because what I'm trying to do is use the art of distraction, changing my space, doing something different until the problem will solve itself. So I give my, you know, my brain something to work on, and then I distract myself, and usually the answer will come. Not often very quickly. It depends on the complexity. But think about that. You need to have that quiet time. Exactly, Nancy. You need to have that quiet time and to allow your brain to process. Because things happen to us all the time, and, and sometimes I have to rewind the video going, oh, oh, well, what do I think about that? What do I want to do about that? Because there are many things that we want to react in the moment, and sometimes when we react in the moment, it's not our best thinking. It's not our best professionalism. So sometimes you need to get yourself off stage and say, you know what, that's a great idea. Let me think about it a little bit. Let me go ahead and spend some time in The Thinking Chair by John Maxwell. And let me go to the beach or go to the walk or sit with my dogs or put my puzzle together. Whatever the five steps that you might enjoy or your thinking place, you need that time to process because you can't react and think at the same time. It's just not possible. And sometimes you might need some extra time to be able to process this. So in the event that there is anything that I can do to help, this is just a matter of experience and a matter of trying things because, again, I think rather differently than most of the world, which is kind of where this refractive thinking came up with and why I identify with thinkers like Leonardo da Vinci and Einstein, really people that are never content with what is. They're always looking to see what if or why not. And that's really been my MO. But it's kind of being a really square peg in a very round hole. <clears throat> and I often don't fit. Matter of fact, many of my students will tell me that I'm a very unusual professor. I'm very goofy in some of the things that I do, but my goal is the end result, to have fun to get that outcome. So I hope today that I presented some of that goofiness in Dr. C's brain that will help you with your thinking. And again, remember from the presentation today that you have help for your critical thinking is always at the end of your wrist where you change your words, your rules, your imagination, your space, and your tools. So it's been my honor and privilege talking with you today, and I hope that our paths will cross again. Nellie, thank you again for letting me participate. It's been absolutely a hoot. I always appreciate it. So have a good day, everybody. Before you go yes, away, we just want to thank Aww. you. We want to thank you because it's you, 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 you. And uh, it's people like you that we need to remember as we use our risks because um, 
I, I totally believe it. I believe it. And I think that the University of Phoenix must have had some magic on many of us. Absolutely. Uh, doctoral, doctoral students, uh, because it, it, it's true. You know, critical thinking is part of the university. People don't realize it, but the University of Phoenix really does provide us with a lot of things and people should take advantage of it. Absolutely. Um, oh, it's my birthday, isn't it? Oh, yes, Happy it is. Happy birthday. Oh, time flies. Right, well, you're just 23 um, for the second time, right? Yeah, well, it's in five days, but I'll accept that. <laughs> yes, I'll accept that. On the twenty third, if you just take that three and you just complete the, you know, the three uh, zeros, it'll make a uh, twenty. You're only as but young so, as you are in your mind, my dear. Always remember that. Of course, my father says that he's ninety one, and he thinks that we're all too old, anyways. But he's young. Uh, so, guys, take what Cheryl said. It's true. It's true. We do have to do everything you've said, and I want to really thank you for. Um, for coming and for doing this. It's always a pleasure, my dear, and I appreciate the opportunity to work with you. It's just far too seldom. So good luck to all of you. And again, you have all my information. If there's anything I can ever do, please contact me. It'd be an honor and privilege. You're a blessing. Cheryl is a blessing, and we should take advantage of her words because it it works. I mean, the words need to change. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And Cheryl, if you could, there's a link that I added some in my other computer. So it's here somewhere. If you could copy the chat, everyone, uh, go to copy chat and copy it. Okay. You see copy I do, chat? I do, I do. You got it? Copy chat and paste it anywhere you wish. And you'll find uh, a link. There it is. I'll copy it. There's a link to the WizIQ. It's called the course, but it's actually the uh, presenter. The, uh, well, not presenter. It's... Um, I think that's the one. Did I get it right there, everybody? Yes. If you could click on that, Cheryl, it'll take you to a place called Course, and then you'll see a Course Feed. Course Feed means that you can add all the information there. Okay, so just go in there. Right. Hi, I'm Cheryl. I just gave a talk, and if you have any questions, please add them to this Course Feed. Right. Wonderful. I will do that. I've just put the chat in a Word document, so I will have it forever. So you guys have a wonderful afternoon. And again, thanks so much for joining me today. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you. And have fun, everyone. That's what life's about, having fun.